Well, good morning. We're glad you're joining us here at Germantown Christian Center. I'm Pastor Jack Hollis, and we just are so grateful that you've taken your time out of your day today to tune in. And we just remind you we're meeting live and in person. We'd love to see you here if it fits in your schedule, and why wouldn't it? Here at 9 30, 10 30 on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. We'd love to be able to greet you personally and say thank you again. Well, uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, you know, here we are. Another Sunday, another opportunity to worship the Lord, another day to, to be able to rejoice and be glad. I mean, I don't know, I guess so many times in life you're not careful, you can live a life that's, well, you know, when you come and combat and, and combativeness with the world, so to say, you go to work and you have to deal with things and goes on. If you're not careful, you can let your joy kind of just, like, just kind of slip away from you. And I say don't do it. The Bible said this is the day the Lord hath made. We should rejoice and be glad in it. It's a choice and decision we make. I don't rejoice because I feel like it. I rejoice because God said, you need to rejoice. And so I just encourage you, when you get up every day, be glad. You know, like, a, a, like, a, like I've been told before, and you say, how you doing today? And like old Billy would say, well, I woke up, praise God, I'm above room temperature. You know, there comes a point in time when you need to rejoice and say, this is what God has made, I want to rejoice, and I want to choose to take the best advantage of this day and live for him and enjoy the fellowship that he has in our lives. Amen? Okay, well, if you have your Bibles, we're going to just encourage you again. We've been the last several weeks about a little series about getting your needs met. And I know there's a whole various things about getting your needs met. There's a lot of different needs. You ever notice you get four people together, you're going to have four different types of needs that they probably can represent and say, hey, I need some help from God. You know, we've got natural needs, and you've got spiritual needs and emotional needs, and, and, and you know, it, it varies, but the thing we need to understand is no matter what we face in life, we're not facing it by ourselves. The thing that gives me comfort and has for all these years, and I'm sure you as well, is I don't have to live my life for myself. I don't live basically just trying to fuel myself, but rather we need to be significant, that we make a difference in this world. It's not what we take out, it's what we leave behind. That really does matter. And of course, we're coming into Easter, and I think that we can all embrace the fact that that God sowed the life of his son Jesus into this world, and look what he received in return. I mean, what was sown was great, but what was received was, was, was multiplied so many times. And so we can do the same when we invest our life in the lives of others. We can see a, a multiplicative uh, difference being made that, 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 that we can be significant. And I guess that's my prayer every day. It has been for many, many, many decades. Lord, I wish to be significant each day that I live, that, that my life can be used as an example to others and, get, and, and I can invest my life, that's his life, in others so that they too can become significant and we can all become increased in him. If we can do that, then it really does give us an opportunity to have joy. And, and that when we're praying and we're saying, Father, we have need of these things, it's because I need these things to serve you. It's a purpose to it. We talk about prosperity in so many different areas, and, and we want prosperity in a lot of different areas, not just materially, but, it, but in all areas, our relationships with others. Wouldn't it be great to have you know, prosperous relationships with other people, healthy relationships, or you know, not unhealthy ones, but healthy ones? And, and we all want those things, and yet to do that, then we need to be willing to, to invest our life in a healthy way in someone else. And so, you know, there's some things we can do, and today I like to build upon this. And so I'd like to give you a couple scriptures here, and, and we're going to kind of touch a little bit where we left off last week. Um, the words you and I speak matter. Can we all agree that words matter? Yes. I was a kid. I remember maybe you heard this too. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That was a lie. Okay, I don't know who said that. How many know words do hurt? How many that, that words are brutal? And, and, and I think maybe you've had things said to you that hurt your feelings and hurt your heart, right? Somebody looks at you and says, hey, you'll never amount to anything or, or you know, you can't do this. And, and, and maybe don't even give you a reason why other than something you can't change. Folks, there's a lot of things in life that we think that we can't change. But with God, all things are possible to him that believes. Because you see, God made us and created us and he can reveal his glory in us and let us know that what we think we can't do, we can do if it's his will with his help. And so there's some things about the words that we need to make sure that we're not working against what God's trying to work in us. So quick, quick scriptures. I know you know these, but in Proverbs 18, verse 21, it says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. When you can look at your words as being infused with the ability to give life, it will change what you say. It will make you change the way you talk about your circumstances, the way you talk about yourself. Don't ever put yourself down. Don't ever start saying, I'll never amount to, I can't do this, I'll never have this. 
Folks, if it's in the will of God and it's, it's God's will for your life, then why, what we, can we do? We can take that, bring it before God and allow him to bring it to pass. Why are we denying the ability of God when God says, I'm here to help you? If somebody walked up and said, hey, let me help you with that. And you said, no, 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 I don't need your help. And then yet you're complaining why you can't do something. There's a problem. You know, we've all cried out to God, I need help. How many of you ever cried out and say, I need help? You know, and, and so don't let your words work against you. Um, you know, I remember vividly, and I think that we, we don't realize that the impact our words have. You know, the way we talk to God is through our words. I mean, I remember one time when I was in college, and I, I had visited a, some friends of ours uh, that, I, that I was going to school with, and, and they lived in North Little Rock, Arkansas. Of course, I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, so we went out for this weekend little trip to visit his family and get some good food. And I was, you know, of course, my family was in New Jersey, so, you know, you don't go home for the weekend in New Jersey, you know. And so uh, we, we went over there, and I, I brought my car. And I remember as, as I was, you know, we're ready to leave on that Sunday afternoon to get back to Tulsa. I remember I get out there, and I look, and there was a trail of oil and gas and all that coming out from the car that I had. Now, I had a, you know, I had, I mean, it was, it was the car I had. It was a 1973 Cadillac Sedan DeVille. One of the largest cars ever made by man, I believe. Okay, this thing was a boat, about eight gallons per mile. I mean, it was ridiculous, but I loved it. It was, you know, it was, you know, it was the car I believe. I, I believe for that. I worked for that car and was able to pay cash for it. I loved it. Well, I remember I'm sitting there and all of a sudden I see this trail and I'm thinking, how am I going to get back to school? I mean, it's five o'clock on a Sunday afternoon. You're not getting any mechanic to help fix your car at a five o'clock in the evening. On a, in, a, in a residential neighborhood, I mean, forget that. And I remember I'm sitting here looking at this, and all of a sudden, the only thing out of my mouth, I just thought, what am I going to do? And, and at that moment, I realized, I need help. So I sat there, and I just prayed. You know, you get to the place where you, you, you know, I, I, we shouldn't always look at prayer as a last resort. It ought to be the first resort. And so instead of sitting here complaining about the circumstance and, and, and getting upset and everything else, I just sat there and I just prayed. I didn't make a big deal about it. I just said, Lord, I need help. I need, you, I need you to send somebody. I need some help here. I need to be able to get this worked out. I need to get back to school. And I, and I remember this vividly. It was just like out of the blue. And I, I mean, I say this, it's, this is my story, okay? Out of the blue, all of a sudden a car pulls up and uh, God looks at, you having car trouble? I said, yeah. And he, he goes up and he says, he goes, I can help you. Guy gets out. Gets up under your thing and goes, yeah, you got a little hose that came loose of your fuel pump. 30 seconds later, he got it and says, it's all fixed. I was like, well, but I was, I was ready to turn to him and say, how much do I owe you? And he's already, he, he already left. And I sat there and I'm thinking, who was that? I have no idea. I could not tell you. I, I mean, I just don't. I get up there and started the car, started up just fine. Everything was fixed. Got back in there. Of course, I called and told my, my parents, you know, when I got back to school, what had happened. They said, well, you take that thing to the mechanic and let them look at that and make sure you don't get scratched. So, okay, they said, everything's fine. I said, wow, that's, you know, it worked. I, now, I say that to you because of this. Our initial response to our circumstances matter. Your response to something that you didn't want, didn't create, would rather not happen, matter. Thank God my response was not to complain, get upset, throw histrionics, begin to cuss and everything else. But it was like, okay, Lord, I need some help here. Your words matter. You see, they, they help determine where your faith is. What comes out of your mouth really determines and kind of reveals what's going on inside you. Right? I said, right? I mean, how many of you have ever dated somebody before? Anybody ever date somebody before? Okay, three of you have. That's good. That's, a, that's great. Man, I'm happy for you. You know, I know more than that are married, so I don't know what you did about that. Um, you ever notice that when, when you date somebody, you get to know who they are and you listen to them? They're revealing who they are. They're revealing what's on the inside to you. Listen to that. You know, now the thing about it is you, you do that because you get a chance to be able to discover who this person is. Folks, the more we talk to God, we read his word, we're discovering who God is. We're discovering he is what he says he is. That he'll do what he says he'll do. That when he says, I love you, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, he means that. 
And so our words matter because it is a basis, a basis for us to get to know him and for him to, to be able to develop in us a trust that we can say, I can trust God. I can depend on him. He won't let me down. Amen? Amen? Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, put it this way, and we'll skip ahead. As a man so thinks in his heart, so is he. That's why I think it's important that we take the moment of time to realize that we shouldn't be putting ourselves down. Listen, there may be things in your life you wish that were not the way they are. There may be things in your life you wish they were better. I get that. But the thing that we need to realize and recognize is let's be appreciative for what God has done as we're believing God to develop in us in greater ways. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Be appreciative. Be thankful for what you have, even as you're believing for more. Be thankful for the job you have, even as you're wanting a, maybe a better job in the future. Be thankful for the things that you enjoy right now. Because, folks, in that gratitude is the, is, is the, is the seeds for thanksgiving and worship to God. Be thankful that God's taking good care of you. Amen? Okay, anyway, so, so we look at these things. You say, why is this important? Because I think as we're coming into the, even the Easter holiday here, that we realize that Jesus himself was a seed that was sown in this world. God said that, that he sown his son in this world, that whoever would believe upon him would not, would, not, would not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, as Jesus was sown in this world, it was so that we could accept him and, and as a result have a fellowship with God, have a relationship with him. And we get this. But, but there was an act of faith that God said, I'm going to invest my son in, 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 into others and that they're going to receive him and I'll get my family back. Well, I look at that and I say, God was willing to give and sow. I need to be willing to sow my life in the lives of others and be able to sow my words in the lives of others as well. That's why it's important we take time to pray for others. It's the way that it, take, it matters that we notice the needs of others and be able to say, Lord, let me do something to help somebody else. And in doing so, not only does it bring joy to us, but it also helps bring fulfillment of the plans of God in the lives of others. That's how we become significant, as I said. And so if we take this and realize it, then you say, well, what gives me the impetus to be able to see these things come to pass? The best thing that we can do is to, is to receive from God is to change your words and feed on the word. Change your words and feed on the word of God. And you say, well, what do you mean? Uh, it's obvious. You, you and I can see represented us what we've been feeding on. Okay? Our life is going to be representative of what we put in it. Uh, not too long ago, I had someone tell me a story about they had lent their, their son their car, okay? A 17-year-old kid, okay? And he was, you know, had gotten his license and said, yes, you can drive the car. And, of course, he had said, I need you to fill it up with gas. And what this guy did, no joke, was he found a way to put diesel in a gas car. Can we all agree that's not a great way to start off your relationship with with driving your, your you know your parents car okay and so he found a way to put diesel in the car he didn't really he thought green was 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 a better fuel it was green it was more ecologically sound so he saw the green pump and said oh I'll, this must be more you know green initiative and it's make the car have less emissions well yeah it will it won't run and uh, so he put the, the diesel in the car and, of course, he cranked it, and, you know, it ran for a little bit, then it stopped. The next thing he knows, he calls his dad, he tells him what he did, and his dad is sitting there, and he's just like, and I can only imagine the things you'd like to say at this moment in time. Nothing you can say is going to correct the circumstances that have just been happened, right? You've got to deal with where you are right now. You've got to deal with, okay, we've got to deal with this circumstance. All the yelling, all the screaming, everything else, it will not change what has just happened. We understand that, right? That's where you and I need to come to grips with the fact is that, that sometimes in a circumstance where we are, we need to ask ourselves, is what I'm about to say going to change the circumstance for the better? A lot of times it's not. It's just going to make it worse. That's where you've got to take a moment of time and say, okay, I need help. I need to invoke the help of God. Okay, and if I'm going to invoke the name of God, it's going to be in prayer. Right? And so... You know, like in this circumstance, this father, thank God, he, he handled it well. He talked himself down off the ledge, and uh, he went. They had to have it towed and had had it emptied out and spent some obvious line of money to empty out the fuel lines and everything else and got it working. It, just, it cost a little money. And, of course, the lesson was learned. The green pump does not mean it's more 
environmentally friendly. Uh, anyway, and he was like, yeah, I just didn't know it would, why it wouldn't fit in the, you know, the hole. That's why the diesel thing is larger, so it, you know, it won't fit into a gas thing. But, you know, he found a way to make it work. Um, praise God. And, and so what we need to do is say, okay, fine. If my words are important, I need to make sure that I respond to a problem that I didn't cause in a godly way. And that's the challenge that you and I have. How can we sow our life and basically change our words? Is because we're feeding on the word that we can look at a circumstance and say, God, I need some help here. We're fueled by what God says he can do. I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. Father, I need some strength here not to lose it. God provides it and it changes your words. Right? Now you say, well, does it really, it matters a lot. Think about it for a moment. When was the last time you said something that you later regretted saying? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever said something to somebody or said something and you're like, I shouldn't have said that. Now, maybe you said it out of being hurtful. Maybe you said it out of whatever motivation or whatever. But if you were motivated by the love of God, you probably wouldn't have done it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How many times, how many, when was the last time you were driving your car and you didn't drive it in love? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, you're driving your car and all of a sudden, next thing you know, somebody cuts you off. Next thing you're doing is, well, who knows what you're doing, you know. What I'm saying is we need to respond, we need to respond in a way that glorifies God and not our flesh. Because remember this, whatever we do each day, whatever we do, we're either, we're either fueling our flesh or fueling our spirit life. We're either doing something that God wants or something that God does not want us to do. You know, and, and, and I think we've seen what happens when you start having bad choices, bad decisions. They just kind of get escalated out of the way. You know, I, I don't know. I guess I'm, I don't want a day that starts off wrong and continues worse. Sometimes a day starts off not the way you want it. We need to be able to stop it, nip it in the bud and say, you know what? I'm turning this thing around. There have been plenty of times I've gone, I've, I've just taken a moment, gone out, you know, you know, excuse me for a moment, go on and just take a five minutes and just pray. Father, you know, maybe you have to repent. Maybe you need to say, Father, I'm sorry in the name of Jesus. I need you to forgive me of this. Help me. I need some strength here. He provides it. You go in, you have a different attitude adjustment. You've given yourself one with the help of God. These are all important things to do. Amen? Okay. So if we, if we do this and we feed on the word, it'll change our life. It'll help us to be able to get our needs met. Why? Because what happens is our circumstances are not going to be so reactionary. Folks, most of what people praying about as Christians is in response to something that they created themselves. I mean, think about it for a moment. If we could get rid of the stuff that we cause, wouldn't that just free up a lot of our time and, and a, lot of, a, a lot of opportunities for us? Sure it would. I mean, just think about it for a moment. You know, my wife and all that, we, we, you know, we, we have these things in which you know, the, the, we remind ourselves at times and, and you know, I'll, I'll do something and just you know, sometimes irritates her. I'm, I know you've never irritated your spouse before. But, you know, sometimes I get ornery. I just, you know, I just think something, you know, she'll come around the corner and I'll hear her coming and I'll duck around the corner and like, you know, scare her a little bit. You know, when she comes around, and she'll look at me and I can tell she does not appreciate the humor of this moment. And she'll say to me, the Bible says don't provoke people to anger. I went, yeah, I don't want to get you angry. That's for sure. Definitely don't want to do that. I, you know, and, and so what if sometimes you got to be reminded of, you know, just because you think it's cute and funny, it may not be a blessing to somebody else. Okay, so what, what we need to kind of understand is, is that we need to help fuel the lives of others and encouragement for them to serve God. Right? Which means that's, that's kind of one of those things that I need to, you know, maybe invest a little bit more saying that I can call someone else to have a greater day, a better day than a worse day by my actions and my activities. Jesus did this constantly, folks. And one of the reasons I love reading the Gospels, again, just, you know, live your life in the epistles, but the Gospels is I see the way Jesus interacted with people. He was so kind, so generous. He was so attentive with them. I mean, he, and again, I know I've, I've belabored the point, but Jesus noticed people. I mean, if you just read the Gospels, he noticed people. He didn't just see them, he noticed them. He took time with them. What, the things that, that, that it, they stood out to him. I mean, maybe a woman, like we said in Mark chapter 5, that had a, a problem in her blood, you know, the woman with the issue of blood. 
And she, you know, she heard that Jesus was doing miracles and healing people. You know, she came and sought out Jesus. And as she was going to Jesus, it said that she was saying to herself constantly, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I'm getting healed. That's what, that's what her faith was. That's what she said. It said that she was saying as she was trying to find a way to Jesus. Now think of that for a moment. That was her faith speaking. She wasn't saying, oh man, this isn't going to work for me. That isn't going to work. I don't know what I'm doing here. If that were the case, she wouldn't have been going towards him. She'd have just been forgetting. I mean, that would have been it. But she knew if I could get to Jesus, I'm getting healed. And it, 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 was, just, it was just so pronounced that, that when Jesus was walking, people were thronging him, touching him everywhere. It said there, Jesus stopped immediately and said, who touched me? And his disciples looked at him and said, what do you mean who's touching? Everybody's touching. He said, no, somebody touched me with their faith. There was a difference between somebody touching them with faith and somebody just touching them. Folks, our words matter too. There's a difference between someone just saying something and someone saying it because they believe it. Something that's inspired by what does the Bible say? Now we look, we look, and you say so many times, you know, we have all these scriptures that we get, that we look at. Will it be, you know, like, you know, pr uh, pray for those that despitefully use you, bless them that curse you. How many know that that doesn't sound like a lot of fun? How many know that it, it's not, you know, it's not always the greatest ego push, you know, push to have, you know, somebody hurt you and you respond to them in love. But that's what we're supposed to do, right? Well, Jesus noticed people. He noticed people that were hurting. You know, one of the things in which, you know, maybe you don't know, but the people are, are hurting in this world, folks. The reason why people respond the way they do is they're hurting. I learned that many years ago. I mean, even in the, in the medical area. You know, the reason why, you know, if, if you ever go to a pharmacy or a doctor's office, a lot of people go to the doctor's office, they're hurting. People that are hurting, it's hard for them to muster a lot of stuff, to have a great attitude to be kind and sweet and smiling to everybody else if you're hurting, if you're in pain, right? right. And, and I'm, you know, I remember over the years, I mean, I've had physician friends and I, we, we've talked about it. And, you know, one particular person that was, you know, he was, he was getting his residency, going through his residency, and, and uh, he, he was struggling. And I, and I said, you know, I realize the patients you're helping are coming to you because they're in need. They're hurting. They need help. And, and, and yeah, they may not, you know, they, they may not respond as well. Maybe they're not complying as they should be, you know, but they're hurting. What they want to do is, is, is have someone with compassion and to notice them. And so if you can kind of realize that in our daily life as well, we're around people that are hurting constantly. And so a lot of people respond the way they do because they're, they're in pain. And we're supposed to be there to try to help. Because that's what Jesus did. He noticed people where they were, and yet he was able to help them from where they are and bring them to where God wants to, 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 to bring them, to help them. We have that ability because God, the Holy Ghost, lives in us. We have the help of the Word. And so I look at coming into this Easter, and it's a reminder to us that we're supposed to be taking on a lot more of the qualities of Christ, noticing people, helping them. It's a day to celebrate the empty tomb, but the empty tomb is a way that we can celebrate that Jesus lives. And where does he live? He lives in us. You know? And so if we can take this and say, yeah, well, then it does make a difference. We need to notice people. And this Easter season, let's notice the people around us. It's easy to criticize folks. That's easy. But it's another thing to say, hey, let me help you. Amen? You say, well, how do we do that? Well, there's, there's, there's things that we can sow in our lives that'll help it. And I just want to, if you just a moment, there's, there's, I'd like to deal quickly, and we'll, we'll just kind of, is four types of, of sowing that we can do. Four types of seed that we can sow in, the, in this world and the lives of others. And so the reason why this is important, because again, what you sow determines the kind of the harvest you get. Now, how many of you like tomatoes? I love tomatoes, man. I, a good, ripe, fresh grown really good, not one of these hothouse tomatoes in the middle of December, okay? I'm talking like a, a real tomato in the peak of season with the flavor. To me, a BLT is just a wonderful creation. You know, without the mayonnaise, you could have the mayonnaise, just a bacon, lettuce, and tomato like that, that would be great. Now, my wife would say a tomato sandwich. You know, let me know what I'm talking about. 
tomatoes on a salad would be good too. I mean, a good tomato. So if you want a tomato, you've got to, you've got to, if you want to, you, 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 let's say you want to plant tomatoes in your garden, you've got to plant a tomato bush, right? A, a tomato plant. Nobody goes in there and says, boy, I wish I had a tomato and never plants them. Because if you don't plant a seed, if you don't plant a, 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 a you know, go to Ace Hardware or, or someplace and plant that little tomato plant, you can go out to your plot where you have a little ground. If you never planted something there, you have no expectation you're ever going to have tomatoes. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? Well, we got a lot of folks in life that do that. They plant no seed and they're expecting a harvest. If we're not investing in planting our life and the lives of others, how can we expect to have anything in return? I mean, the scriptures talk about give and it shall be given unto you, good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom for the same measure you meet with all shall be measured or given back unto you. You know, Luke 6, 30, whenever you, you that, that's talking about a law of sowing and reaping, that I'm investing my life in something else, in someone else. You know, if, if the Bible speaks of, if you, want to, if you want to have a friend, what do you need to do? Be friendly. I mean, that real, you know, real revelation there, right? You know, if, if, you, if, if we want to have relationships with people, then we need to invest our life in them. It can't be based upon, hey, what do I want? Okay, if, if, let's just use an example here. Um, if you want to buy a gift for somebody, do you buy a gift for them that you would like to receive or a gift that they would like to receive? Okay, uh, let's put it. How many know you do not buy your wife an anniversary present that is a vacuum cleaner? Can we all, can we all, I mean, this hopefully is not a revelation to you, okay? How many know you do not buy a vacuum cleaner for, hey, honey, I, I, I just let you know, I went to the store, I was thinking, I know it's an anniversary, and I just thought, oh my gosh, I saw this and I thought I just wanted to buy it for you. Really, what is it? Oh, it's a vacuum cleaner might not be the wisdom of God right there at that moment. Okay, so what I'm saying is you, you want to give a gift that, would, that, that they want to receive. Makes sense, right? We need to make sure that what we sow is going to be a, a, a pleasant sacrifice, something that was, is desirous in their life. Look to bless people in ways that help them, that doesn't just help you. Amen? In other words, make sure your motives are pure and right. Don't just do something because there's something in it for you. Don't bless somebody because they're in a position to bless you. Okay, but you, you sow the word. Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11 puts it this way. Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11, it says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, they don't re and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Verse 11. So is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty. It will accomplish that which I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. This is the NIV version. What basically is telling us here is the, the word will accomplish what it's been sent to. Now, this is important because if God said it, he will bring it to pass if you believe it. If I will do what the word said and I will apply it in my life, it will work. It will come to pass. The problem is, though, we're going to be in competition with some other things to try to keep it from coming to pass. Anybody ever played a sport before? Okay, you know, for me, the, the two sports I like playing were football, and, and that was more so, and, you know, and, and was, you know, not great, but had a lot of fun through it all the years. Um, and one thing about that is that when you go to a football game, you know and expect you're going to have a fight on your hands. You know there's going to be a competition. Someone else is trying to accomplish a similar goal. They want to score and you want to score. I'm trying to stop them and they're trying to stop me. Well, you, you kind of understand that in a football game and there are rules that have to be abided by. I understand that. But you're putting everything you have into it to try to accomplish and score more points for your team than they can score against you. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Well, the thing about it is there are things that you and I as a believer have to be saying and asking ourselves, what am I willing to to what am I willing to invest in order to see the game won? See, the game is not won just on the day that you play. The game is won in practice as you prepare yourself, as you strength train, as you, as you, as you get good coaching, as you prepare, you do the mental classwork to understand what, what different things mean. In other words, it's not just the time you spend playing the game that matters. It's the preparation time for the game. 
See, the problem a lot of us have is that we don't spend the time preparing for what we're going to be facing in our lives. What shocks me is the number of people who get up every day and do not spend time with the Word, do not, do not spend their time in prayer, and they go out and they begin you know, seeking and doing the things they need to do, and then they're complaining about the decisions and choices that are being made and things that are happening to them. We're not prepared. I said we're not prepared. We need to be prepared. You need to know. You need to be in a position where you've been able to say, "Okay, under this scenario, and this scenario, and this scenario, here's what I here's how I want to respond." God prepares you for these things. I, I tell you, it's amazing the number of times you can be in a situation where you spend, you get up in your day, and you spend, you know, the, your 15, 20, 30 minutes, whatever it is, just praying and spending time reading His Word. You get your mind quiet, and you and you just know, okay, Father, I'm I'm, I'm getting to know you better. Then you go out and you do the things you have to do and you handle it in ways that you're just surprised. You know, it's like, you know, you have difficulty, but you handle them so much better because what you've done is you've put God first and you're allowing him to direct your steps. The Bible reminds us that what we're supposed to do is acknowledge God in all that we do and ask him to direct our steps. And how, do we do, how can we do that? Well, first we put him first. See, it's just, it's not right when we don't put our relationship with God first if we're not sowing those seeds as they were of the Word in our lives every day. And so, if we sow it, it will work. If you read the Word and believe it, it will come to pass. And so, I look at this and I think, well, Lord, I need to put your Word first in my life so that I, number one, know what you expect of, of me and what you can do. When I, when I, I mean, I'm sure you found the same revelation when you're sitting there and you find out and you discover that there is a way to live that, that God is honored by and that you're able to help others and God blesses you. You're like, yeah, I want that. I want, I want to have a part of that. It can't, our life cannot be lived just for us. I mean, we can't just live selfishly. You know, I know everyone likes being selfish, but it, I mean, eventually it gets old. Doesn't it? I said, doesn't it? Sure it does. And so we need to be willing to sow seeds of the word of God and encouragement in the lives of others. Get up, get up in your, during your day. You'll be prepared. God will help you to be able to notice the people around you that you're supposed to minister to. There's going to be people that God will highlight in your life and he says, I need you to help that person. I need you to help this person. I need you to pray for that person. I need you to, need to speak to this person over here. You know, it will accomplish the purpose where I sent it. God is sending you and help other people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus was sent by God with a purpose. So were we sent every day with a purpose. And there's somebody that we're supposed to be touching. And I'll tell you, it, it can become, you know, you don't realize the importance of this. The Bible said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for thou art with me. What he's saying is we're walking around people who are like, you know, they're, they're in need. You know, maybe you haven't had this happen. I have. I've been, you know, in this church. There have been people who have come to this church, you know, sat in, this, in, in a pew and, you know, it, it hurts my heart because I think, Lord, you know, did, did I, you know, was there anything I should have done? Could I have done? But I mean, I'm thinking of one instance right now. We had someone who came to this church, came, sat in a back pew, and within a week, they went and uh, sat down by a tree and killed themselves. Just came in out of it. Just someone who came in there, came, hurt. You know, I mean, I, I, Lord, did I, did I, I hope they heard the gospel. I heard they, you know. But that, when you find out about something like that, that, that hurts you. Because you're like, was there more I could have done? Is there something that I could have? You, you, you know what I'm talking about. When you run, we're around people constantly that they're going through stuff. And just because the lights are on and it seems like everything's fine, you don't know what's going on in that person's life. You don't know what's going on you know, below the surface. We want to be in a position where we can be receptive to making sure that if there's something we can do that God knows, Father, you can count on me. I'll do the best I can. Let me notice people around me. And that's a prayer to me that I, I just, I want to encourage you. 
it was coming, you know, just every day of our life, but not just because it's coming into Easter. But, but make a prayer. Father, I want to become better at noticing people. Not just the things around the outside, but what's going on on the inside. Whenever you read the gospel and you, you find out that when Jesus was ministering to folks, one of the things, my favorite expressions in the Bible is this, Jesus perceiving their thoughts. He kind of knew what was going on behind the lights, if you know what I'm saying. He knew what was going on the inside. of. He was able to touch people's hearts because he knew where they were. My, my prayer is, Lord, I want to know where people are so I can help them. Now, again, none of us are the answer to everybody. Of course not. But if there's, but if God knows the hearts and what, and the, and the, God knows what keys need to be employed to get and unlock the hearts of men and women. And if I happen to have a key that I can use that God has prepared me that I can use to help minister to somebody, then then we need to let God know you can count on me. And that's the reason why, as we're spending time with the Lord, He's preparing us to be able to know this, those opportunities around us. Not to get so busy that we just kind of shut them out because we're too busy doing our thing. Not to stop and notice and do God's thing. Okay. And so, you know, it's important that we don't do that. And so the next thing kind of brings us to this is seeds of deeds. Seeds of deeds, of actions, as I mentioned. Galatians 6, 7, and 10 puts it this way. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man does reap what he sows. Folks, y'all be glad you're reaping what you're sowing. I, you know, I, I, I always got upset when, when, when this was preaching a negative. I'm glad. I'm glad I'm reaping what I'm sowing. You know, if you don't like what you're reaping, what do you do? Change what you're sowing. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's, it's simple sense here. You know, like, it, like it, it's like even in, in a marriage, I've had, I, oh my gosh, over the years, I, I've had, you know, people coming and they're saying, you know, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble in my marriage or trouble in this relationship and everything else. And, and you get down and I'll say, well, okay, then let's just start changing the way you're sowing. Change what you're sowing in each other's lives. Think about it. We talked about the power of words. If you are constantly using words that are not encouraging and strengthening and, and, and life-giving, yeah, it's probably shouldn't be a surprising thing that what you're getting isn't what you want. Right? Yes. You know, so let's change what we're sowing. Let's change the, what we're putting into each other. Yeah, that should be, should be, you know, obvious. Well, if you reap what you sow, then I want to reap good things. I better make sure I'm sowing some good stuff. Right? Okay, so how can you do that? A couple things that you and I can sow that's good. Folks, you don't, it's not all about money. Okay? You know, one of the things that you and I as a believer can do is show, is show compassion in people's lives. Concern. You know, you can sow prayers into people's life, and that's pretty powerful. Take a moment of time to pray for someone else. Now, I did an informal, several years ago, I did an informal study and, in, in, you know, with some folks that I know. And I asked them and I said, on all honesty, of your prayer time, how much time do you spend? And it was different categories. And one was praying for yourself and then the other was also praying for, the, for, the, for others. And honestly, 90% of the people were, did most of their praying for themselves. You know what I'm saying? I mean, something going on, they're praying for themselves. Okay, you know, I get that. What if we started praying a little bit more for others? Start, start taking note, notice of other people. Right? And, but you've got to get in the habit of doing that. How many times have you been driving down the freeway, you see an accident or a crash? And you start, you know, doing the looky-loo, looking, wow, man, that car is messed up. Man, that's, man, that's total. Dang, oh, my gosh. And you drive on. Never thought about praying for them. What I'm trying to say is, if we can start taking note of the concerns of others and the plight of others, and instead of just commenting about it, praying earnestly, it'll start changing, it'll just start changing us. You've got to develop some habits. And, and again, habits are developed because you consistently do something. It takes 21 days to develop a habit, folks. That's all it does. 21 days of consistent behavior, you can develop a habit, bad or good. One of the ways that we can develop is start sowing seeds of deeds in the lives of others. And you say, what can it be? Be willing to sow into someone else's life. You know, let's say you live in a neighborhood and you complain constantly about, I can't believe they don't cut their grass. You know, that the weeds are getting really tall. These people need to cut their grass. Well, guess what, folks? If you got a lawnmower, why don't you go down and knock on the door and ask whether or not you can cut their, la their, their lawn for them? 
I remember uh, another you know story here in our, in our neighborhood up where we used to live up in New Jersey. There was a house down the road, and, and their grass got tall. Neighbors kept complaining about it. You know, they had a little meeting. They get together and start complaining about we need to make sure people start taking it, taking care of their lawn and their grass. Some people are letting it get away from them, and so people are getting all up in arms. No one ever knocked on the door and said, "Here, everybody, everybody, okay." Come to find out, what, the reason why the grass hadn't gotten cut a whole lot is is the 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 the, the wife was going through cancer treatment. And so th th they're kind of preoccupied. You can kind of imagine. Now the neighbors are all upset because the grass is getting a little too tall. It's getting above four inches because you, you have to keep the grass below four inches. Nobody knocked on the door to find out what's going on, why the grass is getting tall. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes we're, we're letting things get away from us that are important. So if something what you notice a problem, why don't you see if you can create? Hey, let me see if I can fix that for you. Is everything okay? Hey, let me I, I'm let, let, let me mow your yard. That seems like a whole lot better than trying to stir stuff up in the neighborhood, getting you know getting somebody the city to come out and find them. Doesn't that sound like a whole lot better idea? Yeah. Anyway, what I'm saying is look to be a blessing to somebody else. You know, you know, look to be a blessing. You know, we can do that in our own household. You know, you know, one of the look, look, guys, you know, one of the sexiest pictures there is for a husband in a home is a, is a man of God on his knees cleaning the toilet. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Cleaning the bathroom. All I'm trying to say is, what are you doing? You're, it's not always has to be someone else. Say, well, that, that, that's that's her job, or that's a no. It's not. It's whatever needs to be done. You're looking to be a blessing. Dishes doesn't just have to be done by one person. Amen. Okay. You know, it's like I wish I had it to show on the screen here. I saw a skit. It's it's hilarious. Uh, but it reveals this. There was a skit between these two, a husband and wife. They had just you could tell they've been married some length of time. And um, all of a sudden, the wife gets home, and she's like, really? There's just dishes on this table and everything else. And, and he just leaves them on there. And he's like, no, no, no. He says, honey, no, no. You don't need to. No, don't, leave, don't, don't move the dishes. Leave them. It's a magic table. It's a magic table? Yeah, it's a magic table. He said, it's crazy. I just noticed it, it's been going. I just, he said, whatever you leave on this table, at night, after you go to bed, instantly gets cleaned up, they, they get washed, and, the, and they get put back in the shelf. It's, it's amazing. It's a magic table. And the wife is like, you've got to be kidding me, right? Yeah, you, you get the idea what the magic table is, right? Yeah, you know, you know. The magic table, she's doing it. There's no magic table here. He's just oblivious to it. But it's getting done. You know, what I'm saying is we need to kind of, be in a situation and realize that stuff gets done. Somebody's doing it. We can, one of the things we can do is sow our life in someone else to help them so it gets done without them having to do it all the time. I know you're glad you came today. Amen. You know. And he goes on to say this, verse in Galatians 6, 8. The one who sows to please the sinful nature from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the spirit from the spirit will, re re will reap everlasting life or eternal life. Now, verse 9, let us not become weary in well-doing. And, and I get that. It, it can be, you can become weary in always doing the right thing, especially when you've got other folks that don't. I, I, I so get this. But notice what it says. Let us not become weary in well-doing, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. Folks, you and I, we talk about it. You reap what you sow. It doesn't mean it settles up every single time. But, but there's a consistency, there is a, there's a knowledge that I'm pleasing God, and God says, I'll take good care of you, it's, it's, it's okay, I'm, I'm looking out after you. Because you don't know when you're going to be sitting there with your car broken, fuel stuff coming out the back, and you sit there and you need some help, and all of a sudden, God sends somebody. Whether it's an angel or who knows, God sends somebody. You know? Just when you have need, he'll send someone to help you. 
because you do reap what you sow. I said you do reap what you sow. I'm, I'm gonna, we'll end it right here. I, I, do, I don't have this good, but I want you to turn over to James, if you don't mind, the book of James, very quickly. James chapter 5. James chapter 5. Found Hebrews, you, you just turn over and you'll find James right there. James chapter 5. And it, it starts over here with the 15th verse. James chapter 5, beginning at verse 15. It's a little bit of a, it, it's, it's, it's kind of the principle that, of which we speak today. It says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Then he goes on to say, verse 16, Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now you think about that for a moment. The Bible reminds us that prayer does work. It does manifest. It does change things, doesn't it? Yes. Sure it does. talks about how that we, should, we can pray for others. Does it not? It says, pray one for another that you can be what? That you may be healed. Pray one for another that you may be healed. To me, that is nothing more than the law of sowing and reaping. I can pray for somebody else that will rebound and, and, and boomerang back to me. It's the law of sowing and reaping. If I can invest my life in somebody else, and I'm not doing it to get anything, I'm doing it just to be a blessing, but God said, I'll take care of you. I'll make sure it comes back to you as well. You know, and that's why you don't have to get weary in well doing because you know my God's looking out for me. If you're if you're the person who charts and start looking, well, well, I, I need to see the return on the investment. My, you know, you know, and you have to see it instantly. Then, folks, that's going to be a very diminutive lifestyle you're living. You need to look at a little bit long term here. Lord, I'm living for you every day. I'm gonna seek after you. I'm gonna seek after what you say is important, and I'm gonna believe you're gonna return it back to me but I'm going to sow what you ask of me and what you require of me, and I'm going to believe in the name of Jesus that I leave a life that is significant in the lives of others, and we can lead people to know you. That, that, that to me, means everybody wins. And it says, let us not be weary in well-doing, because at the proper time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Back to those tomatoes. You know, I, I'm, I'm looking to plant some tomato plants. Because I love tomatoes. And yet I had to wait for the, the you know, I you know, wait for the frost to get over. So you know, had a little cool spell there. So you just say, okay, you have to look and say, okay, fine. Wait for the good time to sow, and then you sow them. And then you got to tend them and water them and fertilize them. Yeah, I get that. But then you have an expectation. That's why I can go out there. You can start every time you go outside, you look and say, oh, I see growth. Oh, here they come. You start seeing buds. Oh, you have an expectation. I know that a harvest is coming. If we're sowing what we're, do, what we're supposed to, if we're doing what we're supposed to do, if we're noticing people like Christ says we should, then we have an expectation that we know a harvest is coming. Right? You know, if you're not doing it, then we really don't. And then Galatians 6.10 leaves it this way. Therefore, as we have opportunity, as you have opportunity, okay, just means as you have an opportunity, let us do good to all people, but especially those who belong to the family of believers. We really ought to look to be gracious and kind to people, particularly Christians, shouldn't we? That's why it's important as believers that we go out of our way to help each other. We're in the same family, guys. Family members ought to stick together, shouldn't they? Sure we should. We shouldn't be tearing each other down, right? Of course not. You know, we ought to be sticking together, praying for them, believing God and sowing and investing. We ought to be making a difference in our life because why? We're in the same family. You know, and because of that, then we have every opportunity. Look for, look for things to be able to do good. You know, it does indeed matter. It helps us to recognize that our, our life does make a difference. Um, you know, you, you get to pick the seeds you want to sow. So pick your seeds. You know, some people are good in doing some things and some people are good in doing other things. Whatever seed you sow, just know this, make it, make it your best. You know, everybody can do something. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe you have the same thing. I grew up when I was a kid. Um, I've shared this story. You know, my mom had a thing where, you know, in our, in our growing up, she made sure people got fed. 
you know. So if my mother heard somebody was going through something, somebody was sick or whatever, or just needed, she'd make them a meal, bring them a meal, you know, good meal. You know, that's just what she could do. She said, I can't do a lot of things, but I can cook. So she used what ability she has. Find out what you, what do you do? What can you do? And just look for an opportunity to be able to sow that. Does that make sense? You know, um, my son, you know, one of the benefits of having a 22-year-old son, um, you know, he, he, you know, you have, you, you're exposed to some technological things. Now, I was pretty technologically savvy as a kid, you know, as I was coming up, just during the beginnings of the computer age. But, you know, a lot of these things, YouTube was kind of new. You, you know about YouTube, but, you know, he's watching the videos. Well, anyway, uh, on the television set, we come up there, you know, you can push a button, it comes up, and YouTube's on it and everything. And so I start finding out there's, you know, quite a few things. And my son now was laughing. He said, Daddy, when are you watching YouTube? I said, well, I see you watching the stuff. So I thought I'd, you know, check some stuff out. Well, there was a couple things that it's tailored to what your interests are. I've quickly learned that they're really smart. You know, they, they know what you're watching. The stuff that is on my YouTube feed is, is very much dad-oriented. Um, and one of the things about it is, is I'm getting these things about people doing nice things for others. Which I guess, if you really got right down to it, if that's what Google knows me of, is doing nice things for other people, hey, that's pretty good. You can have that data, okay, Google? You can have the data. Um, but there's these shows about these people that have companies that go out and do stuff for people. Free of charge, just go out and do like one. And, and, and so I'm sitting here and there's a video that shows, I watch it, and it begets more videos like that. And I'm sitting here and, you know, of course the pollen has been really bad in my house when these videos come on. You know, really bad pollen. It's, you know, just makes your eyes water and stuff. So, you know, you, you know I got to watch out for that. It's really something, you know. And this, this guy out there, and this this guy come out there, and they'll knock on the door, and it's and the guy says, "Yeah, one day a week, our company we go out there and we uh, look to put gutters on someone's house. We do it free of charge. We happen to be driving by your thing, and we see your we like to put gutters on free. And then they and then they look out there and they say, but man, that guy's roof is bad too. They also have their company puts metal roofs on, nice metal roofs, full. Th and he got up and they got thinking, they said, you know, we're going to do your roof as well. Is that okay? They're like, nobody does that. Exactly. Yeah, well, actually, we do. You know, we, we're blessed. We spend one day a week. This is what we do. I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. And the guy's up there, and he's talking about, well, I'm, I'm a vet. I've got heart issues. You know, I'm, I'm just, I'm limited what I can do. And I'm getting, you know, i got stuff coming in my house. It's leaking in there. And I don't know what. He said, well, it's not going to. We're going to take, oh, we're going to take care of everything. And they, and they do this whole process. You get to see them do it. it and you see the, and, you know, and of course, and again, the pollen is really bad when stuff like that happens. You know, you're sitting there watching this. And you're like, this is awesome. This is what these people can do. You get what I'm saying to you? They have that ability. That's what they're doing. Another one, company, they, they're a lawn service. This guy goes out and one day a week, he cleans up somebody's yard that is just heavily overgrown. And the neighbors are thrilled. Because if you're next to a house that's overgrown like that, you're thrilled about it, aren't you? Yeah. You know, and it just goes on and on. And I'm thinking, all they're doing is using what they have. All I'm saying is, we can do the same thing every day. Or at least, whatever, you know, as often as the Lord allows. Use the talents and abilities we have to invest in somebody else. And the thing about it is, a lot of these guys are Christians. And so they, they get a chance to witness, you know, about Christ. And a lot of people they're doing it for are Christians. And they start saying, oh, we've been praying, Lord, send someone. Please help us. We need help. Well, and they said, well, God sent us. Now, I just will tell you, if you watch some of these things, you see them, be very aware that it seems to attract, as I said, I talk about the pollen in the house. It just really, it does happen. And so I'm sitting there wiping tears away. Because I'm just, I just think this is awesome. Blessing somebody else. You know? To me, the spirit of Easter is that. I'm glad God blessed us with his son, aren't you? I'm glad I'm not going to hell. How about you? Yeah, well, what we can do is live a life that pleases him by sowing, you know, seeds of deeds in other people's lives as well. And it doesn't seem like a, it's not, it's, we can just do, we'll just do our part. But we will receive in due season if we don't give up either. 
Don't wait. Be willing to invest your life in others. And in doing so, you'll start noticing the people around because, folks, God wants us to notice people because there's a whole bunch of folks in need. And they're just basically saying, Lord, are you out there? I need some help. Well, that's why God has people like you that love them, that know them, that care about them, and that listen to them. We go out and let them, let them know that Jesus loves them too. Amen? Hallelujah. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for your good and your mercy endureth forever. Father, we just are so thankful that our life does mean something. It's not just a life that's lived by getting up every day and going through the motions and then going to bed. Father, it's not a rinse and repeat. It's a life lived for you with strength and vitality and joy and, and effort. But Father, with great peace. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. You have given us the ability and the strength to live our lives for you, and we are so thankful that you have. Father, when you revealed Christ and you said that whoever would call upon the name of the Lord would be saved, and Father, when we called and he came, filled us with your spirit, we were so grateful, so thankful that it meant our life forever was to be spent with you in full fellowship and in relationship with the Almighty God. Father, we thank you for it. But Lord, we ask you now to help us to be able to live a life that allows us to be able to make a difference. That our life matters. That just like the seed of Jesus was sown in this world, that Father, we sow our life as a seed in the lives of others. As a reminder of what this Easter holds, Father, it's a season of, of newness. A season to, to reveal what's really hidden. Father, we thank you that our life is so much better than even what we think it is today. With your word, it reveals to us our potential and the ability that you're working in us to accomplish. Help us, Father, to notice others. To be somebody that willingly sows their actions and, and their life and their talents and abilities in the lives of others so that you, Father, can reveal your love and concern for everyone whose life is touched by it. Father, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. You said in your word that whosoever would simply call upon the Lord would be saved. Father, I pray for anyone listening under the sound of my voice, if they have yet to accept Christ, that, Father, right now they're doing that. They're saying, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Cleanse me from all the wrong of my life and Father, help my life to have significance in this world today, all because of the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you, Father, for healed bodies and well minds, for strong bodies that are able to do all that you've asked, and a willingness to walk in love towards all and reveal that Christ is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, those of you joining us online, I'm glad you did. Hopefully you had a good opportunity today to hear something that will bless you. I know it seemed like kind of practical, but that's good because you and I as a believer should be able to live a life every day that makes a difference in the life of somebody else. Jesus got up every day saying, Lord, what's next? What do you want me to do? That's a great way to live. Every day we get up, we say, Lord, what can I do to make a difference in someone else's life? Whether that person's life is the person you live with, one of your kids, maybe on your job, your boss, one of your coworkers, or, or some stranger you happen to be in the store with. The fact is, God has you where he needs you to be so that you can be a difference maker wherever he leads you and directs your step. You see, in that life, we're able to be significant in that way. If there's something we can do for you, I hope you reach out to us on the screen. There's some ways that, that you could do that. Contact information is there. If you'd like to be a blessing to this church and ministry with your gifts of support, we say thank you again. We'll use it faithfully, and we thank you again for your, well, for your willingness and for your faithfulness. That information is on there as well. And until we see you again, either Wednesday night at 7 o'clock or Sunday at 9.30 and 10.30 in the morning, always remember God loves you. He cares about you. He has a plan for your life. And never, ever forget it, but Jesus is 
Lord. Have a wonderful day. God bless you richly. Bye-bye now. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, uh, I appreciate you all. Now that we said goodbye to them, we got you all here. Amen. <laughs>